So the train car that I'm trying to turn into a retail space and podcast studio is still slow going and not a lot has changed yet. The floors aren't started yet and the walls and ceiling have only been sanded over so the painting hasn't started. The online shopping carts that I've been testing out to sell items are going good and I'm learning a lot from trying them all out. But I need this process to be faster. Creating content and managing it are two different things I'm finding if I want this to be something that supports me. So I decided I'm going to get an intern, which is weird. I mean, I'm just used to taking care of things myself, but I think it will move things a lot more in the direction that I want to go. Or it will be a huge mistake. So I'll find out, won't I? I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. <laughs> person I get to meet today is another one who responded to the artist interview call out that I did on the American Bandito mailing list. My name is Brennan Reese. The best way to describe what I do is I am an artistic polymath. Okay, so I had to look up polymath after he said that. A polymath is a person who knows a lot about a lot of subjects. I have made a career out of not being able to focus. And after 25 years of not focusing, I've become employable in a number of different fields. I have worked as a barista, which is the larval form of graphic designer. From barista, I ended up going to film school and dropping out of film school and becoming a graphic designer almost by accident, working as a medical writer, working as a photographer, an illustrator, and designer of many things. I, I uh, am probably best known for my work in the role-playing game industry, designing books and book covers, and working as a jazz and blues guitarist. Brennan currently lives in Auburn, Alabama, but when he was growing up, he was trying to make his way out to the bigger cities to try and be a filmmaker. As soon as I could, I, I went to Los Angeles, and I lived in Los Angeles, and I, I went to uh, film school in Pittsburgh, and lived in Atlanta and D.C. and Philadelphia. And Orlando and just shy of my 30th birthday moved back here and had a kid. Are you still trying to make films or what no, happened with that? No. Uh, so my my dad worked in the film industry throughout the 80s. Somewhere in a trapper keeper in my studio, I have one of the original shooting scripts for The Terminator. Really? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he worked in like the 80s. Uh, 80s Hollywood has stories about hanging out with Mickey Rourke and and you know he knows knows all of the you know knows all of these these people and so I went out to live with my dad in Los Angeles and work on movies and my first job in my entire life first paying job was working as an art assistant on Stargate oh wow so, yeah so uh, you know the the that big kind of spaceship temple thing. That was me and a couple of my buddies stapling a bunch of vacuum form PVC. To, Come on. Uh, right? No, man. It's all it's all pre CGI. And then we painted it. And we made it look all metal, metally, and you know, painted a lot of styrofoam. Looked like the interior of a pyramid, and uh, it was it was really cool. Got to share a bag of burritos with Kurt Russell, and you know, so that was <laughs> as an eighteen year old kid, that was pretty cool. Well, it's pretty and, cool now, still. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so. I, I had always wanted to go to film school. I considered film the node between all of my interests because, you know, I've always been interested in literature and mythology and painting and photography and music. And and I just thought, you know, what, what a perfect thing to get into. I said, you know what, I'm going to go to film school. I went to film school and uh, I was helping a guy on a senior project and he did not know anything. And I thought this is this is the guy, the school. He's the creme de la creme, the their star student, and he doesn't know basic stuff that I just kind of picked up by hanging around on set. Mm -hmm. And I was a little bit disillusioned and ended up, you know, meeting a girl and and going off on lots of different adventures and never worked on another movie after that. Wow. So I, I do a little video production, but it's it's mainly just little little things here and there for, for clients. One thing that I wanted to know more about was in the email that Brennan sent me, he mentioned what he does. He does artwork for games and tarot cards. And I had never met anybody who did either of those things. You've been doing tarot cards and right. games. Like you have a game that you were involved in. Goth Court, yes. Goth Court. I was going to say yeah. Goth Castle, and I'm like, that's not right. I'm the art director and graphic designer for an independent game studio called Billy Pulpit Games. If you were into role-playing games or live-action role-playing, you'll know them from a game called Fiasco, which 
they'll probably hate me saying this, but this is the best way to explain it to people who aren't into it. It's basically a role-playing game where you sit around with a bunch of your buddies. It's what is essentially a Coen Brothers movie after about two hours. And you're just kind of improvising a Coen Brothers movie on the fly. It can be much more subtle than that, but for most people, because that's the cultural touchstone, okay. that's the way I explain it. They've done some incredible games since then. There's a, a game called Night Witches, which is a role-playing game about female bomber pilots, Soviet bomber pilots during World War II who are flying the old obsolete uh, biplanes. There is a game called The Warren, which is not really based, but inspired by Watership Down. Mm. There's a game called Winterhorn, which is a game that, that teaches like serious activists how to recognize when people infiltrate their group and try to destroy them from the inside. So you have some some like serious environmental or social activist group and some government agency comes in and tries to break you up. It, it's going to teach you their techniques. The majority of Bully Pulpit's games are the work of a, a just brilliant game designer named Jason Morningstar. And it's a lot of fun to work for those guys. How did you start working for them? Years ago when I turned 30, I, I was playing some computer games just because of the graphics. I thought the graphics were cool and I, I got kind of bored with it. And I came across this forum called Story Games where people were looking at D&D, but they were designing these other games to fix what they saw as, as problems or um, trying to uh, solve uh, player problems at the table or trying to fix a culture of play, building games around different themes. It was interesting because a lot of these people had you know philosophy degrees and history degrees mm -hmm. and they were geeky, but maybe not so much in a traditional sense. They, they were you know, geeky about linguistics or semantics and or or uh, esotericism. And so they were they were building these games where if you take D&D and you replace the wargaming DNA with creative writing and improv theater DNA, you're, you're getting these games where people are, they're not just killing dragons and orcs and stealing their gold. They're about forming relationships and making difficult choices and in some cases facing your own demons head on. And I found these fascinating. One of the things I noticed is that these people were doing their own layout and they weren't very good at it for the most part. And there were a few of them that I thought were incredible games and people were just giving them away for free or selling them for very little. And I thought, you know, one of the things I can contribute to this community, this was pre-child, of course, I can do layout for these people. I can give some of these people some, some beautiful looking books. And I made a lot of friends and I did a lot of free work and then people started paying me, and more people started paying me more. I have now won awards for book covers and had to kind of cut back on my freelance work, and now I'm really only working for Darker Hue Studios and mm. Bully Pulpit. Wow. So I've always enjoyed meeting people and sharing ideas online, but how did he go from doing that to actually getting paid for doing it? They were starting to get some, uh, some critical notice, and they were starting to make some money, and so they'd say, hey, you know, how much would it cost for you to do this many pages? And I had this little scale of the complexity of the page, you know, 10 bucks for this and 30 bucks for this. And we'll figure out how many pages, pay me what you can afford to pay me. I've never really had to do that to make my living. I make a, I make a decent amount of money doing it. Huh. And then after a few years, people started reaching out to me that I didn't know. I took on lots of jobs. I, I was—it was kind of like being like like being a bass player. You don't turn down a gig. You know, you always—if if there's a gig, you keep playing. I, I learned my lesson with that after a while, and um, I started being a little more selective. Then I, I started trying to position myself as the grouchy guy who was. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it the way I want to do it, and I'm going to charge more than anyone else, and I'm going to position myself as the luxury option. One of the projects he's doing is a book with Chris Spivey and Darker Hue Studios that's built upon fixing a surprising history by one of science fiction's originators, H.P. Lovecraft. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Lovecraft's work at all. Without Lovecraft, we wouldn't have science fiction or horror as we know. We wouldn't have Alien, we wouldn't, you know, wouldn't have Hellboy, we wouldn't have any of that stuff. He created this open source universe, this open source mythos that other writers and artists can, could go in and they could they could use and they wouldn't have to pay for it. It was beautifully imagined and he was a really smart guy. 
and incredibly racist. And, and it's like, how do you balance that? And so um, my friend Chris Spivey, African-American game designer, as a, a young black kid who loved Lovecraft and loved role-playing games, and he hated the racism in Lovecraft, but mm -hmm. he still loved the stories, and he hated the fact that he wasn't represented in comic books and he wasn't represented in these games. So he decided that he was going to fix this. So he, he wanted to do his dream project since he was a kid was creating a cult Hulu source book based on the Harlem Renaissance. So a couple of years ago, I reached out to him. I saw his name on a, on a game design convention list. We met up and had some drinks. Next thing you know, a year later, we had put together an award-winning book. Wow. And now we've got some, some major people signed on. Wow. Uh, and I have my day job which is basically doing the same kind of stuff, graphic design and photography. Okay, so you are doing a similar thing, but it's working for a company that has you do yeah, it. Yeah, well, I, I work for Auburn University. Oh, um, okay. I do the communications marketing for the Department of Chemical Engineering. I can work on personal projects there, and as long as it's really sharpening sharpening my skills and staying up to date, I get, get all the toys I want and reimbursement for courses I want to take. It's a nice, it's a nice situation. I wanted to know about how he found these people and connected with them online. And one of the things I've always heard is not to rely entirely on a social media platform because it could go away at any moment. And that actually happened to Brendan pretty recently. Google Plus may have been the butt of a lot of online jokes, but for the most part, it actually did have a loyal following and network of people that stuck around. Back when Google Plus was a big thing, I had thousands of followers uh, and I was very well known in the kind of role-playing game community there. Yeah. So I would push things out to them. Now what I'm doing is I'm going through Facebook and I'm adding people who know people I know and trying to rebuild my network. And I'm starting to post a lot of stuff there. So growing up in Alabama, my family and my, my network there, they're maybe not quite as open to the kind of creepy interests that I have <laughs> and to like, you know, the, the tarot cards and the oddities and everything. So I've you know, most of my time on Facebook, I've, I've kind of shied away from, you know, advertising that. And then Instagram, what, whatever I want to do, I post there. So I, I've kind of kept those um, open. And I've, I've really been trying to just, you know, market things and, and work on my, my tags and posting regularly. And I probably don't market as aggressively as I should. Mm -hmm. But really, for me, it's not about marketing. It's about making the art. And if I have the energy right. to spend the time marketing, I'd rather actually be making those. So what would you say is the biggest challenge transitioning over there and also what you're trying to figure out to make those connections with people? Like what's the hardest thing? One of the things that I've noticed is the algorithm is is really strange because I'll see someone's post from 10 days ago. Yeah. And so it's not like the old times when you could, you know, you could post something at noon and everyone who was scrolling by at noon would see it. So that that's kind of frustrating. On Facebook it's it's I'm Still a bit hesitant to just go like completely free flag and show everybody. But on Instagram, I just I put about 20 tags. I, I get people sending me messages and, and following me and sharing things. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's that's great. And I feel like I can connect with people without having to actually read their opinions, which can be nice. What are some of like the most interesting things that have happened because oh, you were interacting with these people? The people who were members of this forum a decade ago, a, a large number of them have gone on to work in the game industry, in the mainstream game huh. industry, working on video games. And, and I can go to a game store in a major city and say, hey, there's a book I worked on. There's some of my artwork. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so I, I like that. A lot of times these people, they're in the hobby and they kind of dabble in the design, but they have real jobs. And mm -hmm. oftentimes they'll work for a company that needs a, you know, a magazine design or a logo design, or they'll have some personal company. So I'll get to do that. Sometimes they'll get in touch with me and ask me to record a song for them. So yeah, just, just lots of, lots of weird things. I've gotten to, you know, gotten to fly a few places, go to some conferences and meet people that, you know, in real life and have a, a good scotch with them that, you know, it's the connections to, to have, um, a network of interesting, thoughtful people all over the world. I can say, Hey, you know, what are you guys reading this month? Or what films have you checked out? Let me know what, what your favorite things are. And so I have this kind of amazing um, kind of artsy geeky hive mind that I can call on. Brennan tells me a little bit more about the tarot cards. I was one of the three goth kids in Opelika, Alabama. And my grandmother had gone to this 
weird outside artist Hindu guy who lived outside of Columbus, Georgia, and had a fortune told. And his temple, uh, Pasaquan, is now a like a an outside artist historical site. It, it's really cool. But my family had these kind of practices that they called old wives' tales, which were basically like. I was a weird kid who was brought up on horror movies. We went to this new age store that opened up in Auburn uh, when I was a kid and there was a pack of tarot cards and hey, they look cool. There's lots of art on them. And so being, you know, the, the weird asthmatic kid in the, the serious little Alabama redneck neighborhood, well, hey, you know, I, I can't, I can't play football. So I'm going to be the, you know, I'm going to read tarot cards for everybody. Yeah. Cause that'll um, make you cooler. Yeah. That'll <laughs> make me cool. So I, I read tarot cards and then, um, uh, a few years ago, I thought, you know, I, I, as an illustrator, it would be really cool to make a deck of tarot cards. And so I, I started to say, well, you know, if I'm going to do it, I want to do it right. So I started researching and started researching some more. And I started buying tarot cards. I started reading lots of books and was getting really deep into it and getting really, really deep into the history and the philosophy and the art. And a couple of years ago, I was like, Well, you know, I've read dozens of books on tarot cards, and it's February, and that's Think-A-Day Month. Think-A-Day Month is when you make something every day. I start out, and I draw a tarot card every day for, I don't know, maybe six days. And then life happens, and several months pass, and I do a few more, and they do a few more. And two years later, I have a, a major arcana set, and it's time to publish. How are you printing them? What is the process for printing those out? I have a lot of friends who do Kickstarters for the games. And I got in touch with a couple of printers to see what kind of volume I would need and what kind of capital I'd have to put out. And I know that the Kickstarter process is a real nightmare. Eventually, what I decided was the amount of effort and money I'd have to put up, I would make absolutely no profit. Mm-hmm. And I'm a big fan of passive income. I just went to one of the, the role-playing game sites that does print-on-demand. Uh, there's a site called drive Through RPG, yeah. and they have a, a sub-site called drive Through Cards. Oh, I didn't and, know that. Yeah, they started doing tarot cards a year or two ago. And so that's uh, I just got the files the way I wanted them and uploaded them and uh, started handing out links. And I don't have to worry about fulfillment. I just have to market it and uh, collect the money. Oh um, yeah, there it is. Drive through cards. It's I knew drive through games, but I didn't know drive through cards. Okay, so I guess I didn't know that they did print on demand stuff. Yeah, a lot of people they'll do their their books that way, and they're they're reasonably high quality. I uh, Bully Pulpit's done several games through them, and will prototype cards. And it takes about a week or two to get the cards in, but there there's a pretty good profit margin. Another one of the things I learned is a couple of years ago, Brennan wrote a book called Productivity for the Depressive Polymath. It's uh, basically common sense things for the advanced jack of all trades. And it, it talks about like ways of, of kind of approaching life and meditation and productivity and art. And it's just a, a cool little book that I, I put together really over a couple of weeks and I put it out on Amazon. Designed the cover into the typography and if people are into time management and meditation and good scotch and parenting and going Canada, you know, if, if you're a polymath into lots of different things and maybe you like the book. It's, it's been very well received. I would love for people to buy copies of it because then I can spend that money um, you know, buying more tarot cards that I can buy <laughs> You can learn more about what Brennan does by visiting his website at brennanreese.com. If you're enjoying this podcast, head on over to my site at americanbandito.com slash subscribe, where you can sign up for the mailing list. And you can also find all the links to the other places that I am. Also, feel free to send me any questions, or if you'd just like to contact me, go to americanbandito.com slash subscribe. The music for this show is by my band, Lorenzo's Music. Thanks for listening, and until the next episode, so long. So long.